Hi, welcome to another edition of Family Matters. I'm Chloe Leary, the Executive Director of the Winston Prouty Center. And I'm very pleased today to have Louis Josephson, the CEO of the Brattleboro Retreat, join me today. Um, welcome, thanks for coming. Thanks for having it's me. It's great to have you. I bet some people are wondering, why is somebody from the Winston Prouty Center talking to the Brattleboro Retreat? So um, I think a lot of people don't think about early childhood and mental health coming together. So, um, so I think this might actually open people's eyes a lot to I what so. um, yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the prompts we're talking to was, I, and maybe a lot of our audience has heard of the term ACEs, um, and uh, it's certainly a buzzword in some of our worlds, but we thought it would be good to just learn a little bit more and share with people what is this thing called ACEs and why should we care? So why don't we start a little bit with what are ACEs? Yeah, so ACEs is a term we use in the field and it stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And it is an attempt by clinicians like myself to describe what we were seeing in kind of not a heavy-handed psychiatric way. Mm. So in our old psychiatric manuals of diagnosis, it used to be the only diagnosis you could give somebody who had had really difficult life experiences was post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh -huh. And that meant you literally had to have like a life-threatening event, a car accident, or mm. be in a war zone. And that didn't apply to a lot of kids especially mm -hmm. too. But in the field, we were seeing lots of children and family who looked like they were just struggling with traumatic experiences, but we had no way of describing it. So mm -hmm. someone came up with adverse childhood experiences mm -hmm. as a way of kind of labeling what we experienced in the field mm -hmm. without a stigma of a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And all it really means is, and we know this from our families of our own, is family struggle, kids struggle, there's divorce, there's substance abuse, there's poverty, there's all sorts of things that mm -hmm. families experience. And what we've noticed and what the field has researched is that those experiences accumulate in children, mm. potentially. And so that's a real concern for us. Um, there is a lot written in the field about a concept of cumulative trauma. So mm -hmm. you, you don't need that car accident to be traumatized. Mm -hmm. You can have parents who are really struggling. There's domestic violence in the home. Mm -hmm. There's not enough to eat on the table always and those experiences accumulate in the child and they start looking behaviorally and cognitively like they've had a traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. And um, so, but it's not a diagnosis necessarily, it's a way to describe a set of symptoms maybe or observations. It is, so yes, we're not diagnosing little, mm -hmm. little kids. Um, mm -hmm. We never wanna do that and it's, so it's not a diagnosis, mm -hmm. but it's helpful in the field for clinicians, for policymakers, for child care centers, uh, because we've been able through research to show that the kids who have, have um, an ACEs score, so mm -hmm. you can actually mm -hmm. um, score all of these things. You have a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and it mm -hmm. gets you to a score. And the higher the score, we see that there is a real correlation with behavior and trauma mm -hmm. um, and even uh, lots of consequences into adulthood. Mm -hmm. So it's very helpful for us to be able to talk to policymakers and others and say, if we don't mm -hmm. attend to these families and children early on, there is literally a price to pay mm -hmm. into adulthood because mm -hmm. they struggle in many ways. Mm -hmm. And was that, I'm, I'm having a memory of the origin of ACEs that actually the initial studies were done on adults. That's and that right. somebody like observing health out outcomes thought, hmm, what happened to them in their childhood? Is that? That's right. It was okay. sort of a retrospective study. Mm -hmm. So you're struggling with substances. Mm -hmm. you, um, you know, keep getting in trouble with the law. You're bailing out of school. And as people looked back at those individuals' history, then they said, oh my God, they hmm. were from a broken home. Right. Their father was in and out of prison, all of those mm -hmm. things. And then the correlation became really clear looking backwards, correct? Mm -hmm. And what I'm, I have a memory also of seeing a movie where people were surprised in the audience about their ACEs score. It's like 10 questions, yes. like the screening is not hard, complicated or hard. Like you can go online and check your Absolutely. ACEs score. Yep. Um, and people feeling like, uh, yeah, again, surprised at some of these things. So what are some of the, I think you've mentioned them sort of as you were talking, but what are some of the? Right, the, and I, I wouldn't want people listening to this to panic <laughs> because right. we know the incidence of divorce in this country right. is very high. We know <laughs> substance abuse is very right. high. 
So just because you had a couple of ACEs or your ACEs score is mm -hmm. high doesn't mean you're traumatized necessarily or that you're right. going to experience problems as an adult. Um, so we don't want people to believe that. The good news in all of that really and what keeps me going um, in my work is just I'm always so impressed by the resiliency of children, mm -hmm. families, individuals. Mm -hmm. So you can, we can take a lot mm -hmm. as people uh, and that's good news for us. So, mm -hmm. um, so you can have, grow up with somebody who has an alcohol problem and have a very successful mm -hmm. life and mm -hmm. family life right. yourself. Yeah. So it's not a one-to-one, -one, mm -hmm. but we do know, again, when you start getting up really high, it's harder and harder for people to be resilient. Mm -hmm. And we know, and this is kind of some of the fascinating research, it actually changes your mm -hmm. brain, mm -hmm. changes your chem mm -hmm. chemicals in your brain. Yeah. And so it's not a, you're not a strong person or you didn't, you right. know, couldn't overcome, but we know it really changes brain mm -hmm. chemistry mm -hmm. in a way that's tough. Mm -hmm. And so um, knowing these things, creates pathways for us to help people mm -hmm. and help people understand mm -hmm. why they're struggling and mm -hmm. having those experiences. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I'm glad you mentioned that, um, the fact that just because you've experienced some of those things that might be on the screening, right. doesn't mean you're predestined to have problems or Absolutely. it's sort of like, uh, here's information and then what are we gonna do about it versus uh, I'm destined to you know, be live a horrible life because my parents were divorced or whatever you happen to see so that's correct um, so that's all true the other part that's really <clears throat> kind of fascinating is that trauma isn't um, cumulative trauma especially doesn't have like a sort of a, a light if you think of like bereavement when somebody dies and you're grieving and at some point usually people get to a better place with that you mm -hmm. never completely forget the person of course but the, the intensity mm -hmm. is, is diminished. Mm -hmm. With trauma, when people have had certain experiences and that trauma gets triggered, people may have heard of like trauma triggers. Yes. It's like you're back. Mm -hmm. It's like you're back mm -hmm. in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think about myself personally, I was working in New York City on 9-11, uh, a couple of blocks from the World Trade mm -hmm. Center and was down there and did a lot of work for the Department of Mental Health mm -hmm. um, at the time uh, post 9-11. And uh, for weeks, I was literally, um, well, months actually, I was in my office on the morning. The first plane flew over my office oh my really goodness. low um, and saw a lot of stuff happening. And I would have this recurring dream of I was having my staff meeting on a table in front of our office building mm -hmm. and we're talking and all of a sudden this plane comes over the building oh and I goodness. wake up. And so it was this experience of an overwhelming experience yep. for my brain mm -hmm. and my emotions. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to process it but being down, if I go down to Lower Manhattan today uh, and go to the memorial, it's not easy. It brings mm -hmm. back, I can literally mm -hmm. remember the smells, the, mm -hmm. the sky that day, all of those things. Mm -hmm. And it's such a reminder to me of the permanence of trauma. It kind mm -hmm. of lays down some hard chemical wires mm -hmm. in our brain. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's hard as a clinician, it's hard for me to make that go away. Mm -hmm. So what we do clinically is if I know going down to the World Train Center would be hard for me, mm -hmm. um, my clinician is gonna arm me with tools to mm -hmm. help cope with that. Mm -hmm. And if I have a reaction in my body, if I um, am feeling sad or panicky, mm -hmm. there's things I can do to work with that. But it is, there's a permanence to trauma mm -hmm. that I have an incredible mm -hmm. respect for. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, it's a real thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think in early childhood, we talk a lot about toxic stress. And I think, you know, maybe there's some connection there, but how um, the pathways in your brain, so when you're little, and so, right, 80% of the brains develop by age three, 90% by age five, not that it's a prescription for, if you're not good at age five, you're bad, but, um, and so when we think about trauma or toxic stress in early childhood, I think the stakes are really even, even the, the chances of hardwiring or sort of getting in there and bedding in the brain aren't seem even higher, so. You're 100% correct. So I've, I'm a clinician, I've done a lot of work with little kids mm -hmm. in my career, and so one of the challenges for that is if you think, try to give you an example, if you're a three-year-old mm -hmm. and um, there is domestic violence in your home, unfortunately, and you're witnessing people getting, you love getting hurt and it's scary and there's yelling, um, that's, you know, at an age where you're still, your thoughts are not, you know, mature, your language may still be developing. Mm -hmm. um, so you're really developing. And 
uh, different for me, like with the World Trade Center. I can sit here as an mm -hmm. adult having that experience and talk right. to you about it and put mm -hmm. words to the mm -hmm. experience. I found as a clinician, a lot of these children, it's kind of pre-verbal. They've had these experiences, right. they're in their body, they're intense, they get these waves of emotion associated with it, but they have a hard time saying, I was scared that day. Mm -hmm. That terrified me. Mm -hmm. I thought my mommy was gonna get hurt. I thought mm -hmm. I was gonna get mm -hmm. hurt. And so when they don't have that language, mm -hmm. it, it, it's a challenge to kind of bring that up mm -hmm. um, and help them work it through as an older child or adult. So mm -hmm. that age, if we can prevent or mitigate toxic stress, mm -hmm. it's, it's so much more helpful. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> so much better. Right. And I think getting, you know, you brought up, or we've talked about the fact that um, this will play out in adulthood. Yes. So risk of diabetes, heart disease, substance, substance use and abuse or yeah. um, some of the, the big ones. And so getting people to understand if we invest now in early childhood family mental health, for instance, we're going to, we don't get to see the payoff. We just are going to have to, I think, uh, convince policymakers and other people who are going to make these decisions why it's so important. Um, and there, I think um, the, um, like, you know, we think of children as blank slates or, you know, the um, not really, um, I think we don't understand the pre-verbal part of it or like the fight or flight, you yeah. know, like when, to, so that there's sort of intent, like you mentioned willpower, that kids yeah. are, oh, they're just misbehaving. You know, some of these ideas we have about kids not as little people, but as like these things that are waiting to be formed by you know other factors. I think sometimes get in the way of us understanding the complicated processes that are happening for them, even when they're super little, even when they're you know prenatal. Honestly, they're still in the womb. So. Oh, there's no question. I remember at the retreat. It was probably I don't know several months ago. We had um, a little child in our inpatient unit who was. Um, really a challenge for us, right? That's why she's in an inpatient psychiatric <laughs> unit at that young age. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would come on the unit and I got to know her a little bit and she'd be cursing and like she was mm -hmm. like an adult who you'd meet mm -hmm. outside of a bar late at night and she was really, really <laughs> tough, um, feisty uh, girl. And when I asked the staff, you know, what, 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 why did she do this? What's going on? And it turned out that um, she had a family member who was uh, addicted to opioids um, was in the family car, luckily strapped into her mm -hmm. seat. Um, the, the adult was high, flips the car over, mm. uh, abandons the child in the car, oh runs away gosh. from the accident. Child is medevaced up to Dartmouth. Mm -hmm. um, so here's a child at a very young age who experienced a parent mm -hmm. abandoning her mm -hmm. in a life and death situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she's in a rage, mm -hmm. you know, and she's mm -hmm. in a rage at me because I happened to walk by her at that moment right. and staff and right. um, just mm -hmm. so, so angry mm -hmm. and overwhelmed with what she experienced. Mm -hmm. And so that's more like a PTSD because it really was right. it, yeah. an, a life threatening mm -hmm. event. But mm -hmm. yeah, we, we mm -hmm. don't see and then we say, oh, why is she acting mm -hmm. this way? Mm -hmm. Well, she's had this very intense experience mm -hmm. and it's just trying to process it, process yeah. her emotions. Yeah. And also, you know, I think about um, uh, we develop strategies for survival. So if you're, you know, if there's no food and your right. parent is unpredictable, and then you've learned a way to get by um, that won't always serve you well. Right. So it's sort of like figuring out how to help. Um, you know, I think learning about this can help you be like, oh, maybe that's why I do this thing. As you, you know, move into therapy about it or think about what what we might do. Um, either to prevent it early on or yes. deal with it once it's happened. So. Yeah, and, and we all have good, resilient adaptations to tough situations. Mm -hmm. We also have challenging ones. Mm -hmm. A common one I've seen as a child therapist is you have a child who's hitting other kids on the playground mm -hmm. or getting into a lot of fights, and you find out that dad is hitting people, maybe mm -hmm. the child, maybe mm -hmm. the mom at home. Mm -hmm. um, and what the child has sort of taken away, we call identification with the aggressor. It's just that. Mm. Uh, a fancy term to say if you're a little kid and you have a scary dad in this case how do you have a connection to mm -hmm. them like some connection mm -hmm. because you're afraid of them mm -hmm. but you love them mm -hmm. and so kids will say me and dad unconsciously mm -hmm. me and dad when we get mad we hit mm -hmm. when we want our way you know we hit that's mm -hmm. how we problem solve and it's an interesting psychological connection it's like mm -hmm. that's how me and dad have something in mm -hmm. common how i can connect to somebody who's really scary right. but we share this yeah. right yeah. i'm like him so mm -hmm. it's 
-hmm. gets complicated. Mm -hmm. You know, that comes up for us um, with some of the families and kids that we work with around um, kids who end up in foster care. Yeah. Uh, and trying to figure, and often in our services at Prouty, we work with both the biological family and the foster family sometimes. Um, and I think helping staff understand um, that attachment is attachment, yeah. and you'll find ways to attach to this adult in your life, like those early experiences that might not be as functional as one would like, or, you know, like, why does. You know, Understanding why a child being removed from a family member, even if they're not necessarily safe there, is hard. And I think that that gets to it, like helping people understand those, that, that I think primary drive to attach. Right. So we'll do it even in dysfunctional situations. We will. You need a home base. I, I worked for about four years of my career in Harlem in New York City for a foster care mm. and uh, preventive service organization. I ran there therapeutic foster care program and a mm. program for sexually abused children who were in foster care. And I saw over years that these kids who were, um, you know, abused by their family member, um, legally, clinically found to have been abused, uh, when they aged out of foster care, where did they go? Right mm -hmm. back home. Right. Um, we remember we had one uh, adolescent who um, had revealed her abuse to our staff and we had walked her through all of these supportive legal and clinical mm -hmm. interventions. Mm -hmm. When it came to the legal hearing, she got up on the stand and said, none of it happened. I made it all up. My caseworker um, made me say made it. Made me say it. Um, she comes off the stand, runs into the arms of our caseworker, crying, I, I know you didn't tell me that. I just couldn't go through with it. I just oh couldn't say gosh. it. So the power of that attachment, mm -hmm. and I don't judge it, is mm -hmm. just right. intense, and we need to right. understand it and respect yeah. it. So have you, um, in your work, found ways to help staff or other adults that, you know, that we work with and support? Um, uh, th what are some ways we help people understand that? Or what are some of the best frames or trainings? Or I don't know exactly what yep. the question is, but how do, how do we help that caseworker and others like him or her to, you know? Yeah, well, I think, I think it is respecting it. The other part is, and, and I don't want to sound um, preachy or anything like that, I think Often, even in kind of the most difficult situation, um, the child finds something good to hang on to. Mm -hmm. And I know it can be really perverse, but I, I've done a lot of work with kids who've been sexually abused. Mm -hmm. And even though we're horrified mm -hmm. by, by it as adults, mm -hmm. and it's, it's traumatic in the extreme, um, for some kids, they can identify that there's some love in it, there's mm -hmm. some connection, mm -hmm. um, something mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. that they mm -hmm. hang on to in the midst of all that trauma. And you know I can't judge that, mm -hmm. and so it creates huge distortions in the future. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, the way people show love is through sexual contact, mm -hmm. and that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to understand and respect that even in something we think is problematic, mm -hmm. people find a thread to hang on to. Mm -hmm. You know, kids, people. I, I've you know once had a, a clinician who said, you know, I feel like my kids that I work with are like lichen; they're on this rock and they're kind of like sucking out this little bit of nutrient from this uh -huh. rock that really is not nurturing, but they've got to hang on. Uh -huh. And so, so that's just super powerful, just yeah. who we are as yeah. Yeah. beings. Yeah, I like the word respect. Like yeah. have respect for what this thing happened or that there yeah. was a survival skill or that they found the good thing and you know, knowing what to do with that is the next step. But, but you know, it doesn't, it's, it's sort of a non-judgmental word, respect. Yes. You know, it doesn't condone it, but it, it gives it the weight maybe it deserves. It has power, yep. You, um, you mentioned the word resilience of several times uh, when we've been talking, so let's talk a little bit about that. Because I, what I sometimes hear, you know, some of the headlines I see even is, uh, and I, we actually have a um, director of trauma prevention and resiliency development at the Agency of Human Services. I don't, oh. I don't know if you knew that. I did not. Um, That's great. Autumn Watersong is our, is, has that job. And I think it came out of the bill, um, the trauma-informed practice and all that um, work in the State House last year. So um, it, it's another, it strikes me as another one of those words that could become a catchphrase and, oh, we just have to build resiliency. But it's, I, I'm not really sure anybody knows the magic of building resiliency or what that actually, so let's talk a little bit about Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, it, it is a kind of, kind of can be a jargonish word yeah. and we don't want to do that. Um, and we've been studying it in the field for a while, like what makes one kid mm -hmm. with a certain problem resilient and another kid mm -hmm. not resilient. 
Uh, and I've in practice seen like the kid who grows up in foster care, struggles, 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 and then gets to college, right? And you're like, how did that happen? Mm -hmm. Because the kid who was in the same foster home ended mm -hmm. up in jail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what I've concluded, and I don't know, you know how this translates into policy, but there's usually something. It's not just purely your DNA, you're born with more right. willpower, strength. Uh, there's some of that, of course, but somewhere, someplace along the line, there was one person, mm -hmm. maybe, and it may not be a non-traditional person. It mm -hmm. could have been that counselor at the YMCA. Mm -hmm. It could have been a teacher. It could have been a coach, um, somebody in your church mm -hmm. um, that believed in you, that had mm -hmm. a connection to you, that people hang on to when mm -hmm. it seems like nothing else is really there. Um, and that's what I've seen the difference. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the kids I remember uh, that I worked with in New York City that were touted as these you know, success stories mm -hmm. out of the blue that no one um, predicted or how did that happen. When I actually got to know those kids, they were really struggling yeah. with substance abuse, yeah. with falling in and out of college, so they uh -huh. got to college. Yes. So I think we all, we, sometimes we just wish that this kid, that's the one. Mm -hmm. Kids can be really resilient, mm -hmm. but it's often you know, little things that make a difference. Mm -hmm. And I, so I would say to your question, you know, as providers of care, um, as policymakers, we don't have to like transform the community. Uh -huh. We don't have to have you know the the best after school program in America uh -huh. or anything. But you know we've got to have some opportunities, mm -hmm. modest opportunities mm -hmm. maybe for connection with mm -hmm. people with community, mm -hmm. um, and that might be enough. And maybe it doesn't scare away the policymakers mm -hmm. that we're going to ask them for mm -hmm. a million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so I'm you know. Again, kids are mm -hmm. resilient, but they need something mm -hmm. to hang on to. Mm -hmm. That strikes me. You know, some of the, um, we've been talking, there are different tables in the community where um, I think we're trying to make a connection between tra traditional health care providers, acute care, maybe mental health even, and um, so the services that are social determinants of health. Yes. And so uh, understanding how that's all connect, you know, um, the overlap. And I, the word connection actually comes up a lot, not just for kids, mm -hmm. but we've been talking about how do you deal with homelessness or adults who are struggling with substance abuse, are they connected and in a way that sort of gives hope or, you know, I, I'm gonna use the word love and mm -hmm. I'm thinking of Mr. Rogers actually and, um, you know, there's some work out of the Fred Rogers Institute around simple interactions and it's an early childhood model, but like what really helps kids thrive and it's that sense that some one person cared. Right you know, um, and that that can make a difference. So to the extent that uh, the neural pathways are damaged by trauma or traumatic events or toxic stress, are they, um, you know, as the antidote or the healing part, the connection or love in a little L, where, you know, I don't, but I, yeah. That yeah, I would agree. I, I think as much as the brain, we're just talking about how brain chemistry gets wired in a negative way through mm -hmm. trauma, um, we also know, I don't want to confuse people, but we also know that the brain's very plastic, and yeah. that's the word right. we use. To, it's mm -hmm. malleable, it's changing. We mm -hmm. used to think that, um, and I'm so glad for this at my age, that your brain, <laughs> just, your brain cells just start <laughs> declining as you age, but really there's all sorts mm -hmm. of potential. Your brain is always growing, rewiring mm -hmm. itself. Um, so if we can attach ourselves to that natural organic mm -hmm. process and mm -hmm. provide some of those opportunities, mm -hmm. it can counterbalance some of the trauma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And your work, it's so um, great to hear you talk about your experiences and stories and sort of to hear directly from someone who's been there sort of what, um, what some of the success looks like. And actually, I, I wanted to reflect back the success stories or the, oh, look, that person pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, like that sort of right. you know, Puritan like work ethic thing, you know, remembering not to, um, there's no poster child here <laughs> for like somebody doing well. but. Um, are there other things that you've seen that are effective strategies or when you think of treatment, um, eat from, all the way from sort of upstream to downstream, but like um, where, where, where we can make the most difference? Yeah, so when I'm talking up in Montpelier to policymakers about sort of mental health in general, mm -hmm. um, they want or expect me to say, you know, we need more money and sure we need more money, but uh, if they really listen to me, I will tell you and I will tell them that we're spending money in all the wrong places. Mm. We spend money in Vermont, in America, after things are broken. Right, right. And the political cycle doesn't allow us to make mm -hmm. those early childhood investments mm -hmm. that will prevent mm -hmm. adult problems. Uh, no one can claim credit 
15 years later right. that we did something <laughs> great for these kids right. and now look, they're not in prison, that's right. wonderful. Um, but there's so much research on that. If you go to the Children's Defense Fund, mm -hmm. they talk about the cradle to prison pipeline. Yes. And literally in this country, you can go by zip code and mm. determine the likelihood of a kid ending up mm -hmm. being born in a zip code and ending up in prison. Mm -hmm. And so that's really sad, mm -hmm. but there's also opportunities there. Mm -hmm. And so I would say what we need to do is early childhood. I mm -hmm. mean, that's really, we mm -hmm. won't prevent everything, of course, no. but it's so much more valuable because um, we know, you're the expert in this field, but we know that zero to three especially mm -hmm. is when so mm -hmm. many important things biochemically in the brain, but just emotionally, mm -hmm. the, the attachment, mm -hmm. there's nothing more mm -hmm. important than healthy attachment, mm -hmm. nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, so and you, I know, probably better ideas than I do about, you know, what are the programs and services right. to make yeah. that happen, but that's, that's where we need to focus mm -hmm. our energy, mm -hmm. I think, as a society. Mm -hmm. And that's a great point um, that I, I do think people are aware of that. The, there's an early childhood council in our state called Building Bright Futures. And um, the State Advisory Council just had an early childhood family mental health task force. And we put out a report um, sort of making recommendations about how to invest upstream. And so I think that, that it's nice to hear that reflected from, from a clinical point of view and just from somebody in the field that um, the more we can think about um, Again, getting upstream, right. even th but nobody can take credit for it. So I'm sort of I'm stuck on that. I'm like, how can we yeah. get around that problem? But we'll just keep plugging away on that. So um, I have one last question sure. for you, and that is, do you ever miss um, providing direct service, or oh, do you God. still get to do it? No, I miss it so much. So uh, I did years and years of that, and years of supervision. I taught in social work mm -hmm. programs for many, many years, um, but. The being the retreat at the C the CEO at the retreat is just uh, all consuming. So mm -hmm. I still do a little bit of supervision. I still mm -hmm. get out on our throughout our programs and help out here and there. Mm -hmm. um, but I really miss it terribly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's what I'm really trained to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so uh, and, and it's just such a rewarding experience. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yes, I do miss yeah. it. Well, and actually, I know I said one last question, but I, I would observe that there are th some things, I'm guessing there are a lot of transferable skills you have as a clinician to your work. Like you were saying, I'm, you know, I was really trained to do that, but here you are, you know, running a very large organization and hospital and doing it very well. And um, I'm guessing your background helped you do that too. I think so, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's always a little bit of a joke to me when I get brochures for companies for advertising workshops for managers and it's all about emotional intelligence <laughs> and things that I learned you know back in social work school it's so obvious right but for somebody who has a business degree they just think well I tell people to do the yeah. job and they're supposed to do it and if they don't do it I discipline right. them and as opposed to we're right. building a team right. people have feelings about things so yeah so yeah I use those yeah. every day yeah and back to early childhood too actually the work yes. of early childhood is social emotional development when That's you right. get all of those team building and other skills. So yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. Thank it's you. been it was great fun. talking Appreciate to you. It. Thanks for joining us for an episode of Family Matters and we will see you next time.